I'm Sonia Morton Firth and you're watching The Sonia Morton Firth Show. Today my guest is Andy Coley. Andy is an international award-winning NLP trainer. He is also a speaker and coaches in resilience and leadership. Andy has been through a journey of transformation himself, from losing his dad to Parkinson's, going through a painful divorce and getting to 23 stone in weight. This left him feeling a failure and contemplating ending his own life. Andy now helps shine a light on others and helps them through their dark times. Andy, thank you so much for being a guest on my show. It's great to have you here. Thanks for letting me come along and so pleased to be able to have a chance to chat to you. Yeah. So Andy, tell me about your journey. I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're one of the top trainers for NLP in the country. Why NLP? Well, what started you down on that route? I got involved with NLP about um, 10 years ago, I think. Probably that's when NLP first came into my life in terms of me finding out about it. Um, I recognised I needed to shift lots of things that were happening in my life. Lots of things had kind of really gone wrong. And at the age of sort of just coming up for 33, 34, you know, I found myself in a position where I just hated where I was in my life. And I knew I had to make changes mm. and I had lots of stuff going on in my head and all the, you know when you go and get those inner voices and all the, the doing all you can hear is the kind of critical bit all the bit that's just shouting at you saying all the things that you're doing wrong and have gone wrong and all that kind of stuff and I just had so much inner thoughts going on that I needed a way of kind of clearing happened, it out. What happened or what was going on for you at that point? Well just around Christmas 2010 I'd just moved back home with my mum and dad mm. um, Back home so to how, my family so bedroom. How, so how old were you at this point? <laughs> it sounds three. You might have been a bit old to go yes, back to your parents. Yeah, it's not exactly where I thought I was going to be mm. um, at the age of 33. You know, when you look kind of map your life out when you're in your 20s, and you're mm. going to get my job and have a marriage and do all these things, you know. Have a lovely the house. To yeah. Do, yeah. <laughs> and uh, no, it all went a bit to shit, really. So um, I moved back home with my mum and dad, um, who um, allowed me to kind of reset my life because... I'd had a couple of businesses that had failed and gone wrong and my friends and family and other people had lost quite a bit of money in terms of, you know, money they'd kind of invested. In, so they'd invested in... Yeah, and, oh. personally into, into the business. Mm. Um, I also had my marriage of 11 years to my ex-wife um, that was coming to an end and it kind of had come to an end whilst we were still just about talking to each other. You know, we'd kind of done the living in separate bedrooms in our makeup house that we'd kind of got a couple of years before where we thought, well... Let's see if we can kind of make it work, make it work, and it mm. just didn't. So you, you yeah. must have met your wife when you were quite young then? Yeah, or? I was in my sort of very early 20s when we got married. Um, in fact, she was pretty much my first girlfriend. So you yeah. married your first girlfriend, <laughs> did, that's yes. almost like the love story that everyone talks about. Well, okay, you call me a late quite... bloomer. You know? <laughs> You know, I, when I was growing up as a teenager, uh, I was much more into scouts and activities and, you know, I, I skipped the drugs and the girls bit um, and kind of uh, sort of found, um, you know, relationships and things were, became a little bit more important in my early 20s. Mm. And she was a friend of a friend and we had a, you know, a good marriage for several years and a couple of things then happened. One um, was I got myself into quite a lot of debt. So I was working for myself, I was running my own web development company and I was getting work but I wasn't getting paid to the lifestyle that we had you know and I was borrowing money off of cards and loans and other bits because I thought I could save you know it was my job as a man to you know be the white knight and come in and rescue and sort everything out and it's okay you can stop work and I can provide and do all this stuff and I was putting more and more stress onto myself and I didn't tell her anything about it I kind of buried everything that was going on under this you know, basically sort of in this big box in my head yeah. um, where I kind of stuck all the problems. And, and it was really, really, really destructive behaviours I was doing, like, you know, letters from the debt companies. I'd go home at lunchtime from where I was working, intercept the post, then go back to work. Oh, wow. For the afternoon okay. Oh, so wow. That she so wouldn't there find was out a level of, yeah, yeah. You, were, you were hiding things from your wife. Absolutely. That yeah. And I wasn't empowering her to help me mm. um, because I was playing a script in my head that said as soon as she finds out about all the stuff that's been going on, you know, all the debt and everything, that's it, the marriage is over. My stuff's going to be in the forecourt, plastic bags, she's going to chuck me out. You know, dad's going to change the locks. I'd play through the scenario of telling her. So um, in a way, you sort of sab without putting yeah. words in your head, do you think there was an element of sort of sabotage, self-sabotage to the relationship? Or Yeah, there was, you, but it was, I thought it was coming from a place of protection yes, and, of course. and, you know, 
wanting to make things better. Mm. You know, she'd had bad relationships before, and as people do, and I wanted to not make this one the same, and by not wanting to make it the same, I made it the same. You know, and kind of played through that scenario. Um, and then something else that happened around the same time that she found out about this stuff. And, I, you know, again, my parents lent me a lot of money to bail me out of the mm. debt. Um, and we kind of got the relationship a bit back on track because when she found out about it, one, I wasn't there. I was away on a stag do in London and I got this phone call going, what the fuck? So, yeah, I've just opened this letter. You know, our mortgage is 40 grand more than I thought it was going to be. And, the, you know, what's these loans and the, you know, all this? And I just thought, oh, you know. That's it. It's probably Over. not what Done. you want to hear when you're just about to get not lashed really. on not the stand really. too. <laughs> um, and so my parents helped me and we sorted it out and we mm. went to marriage counselling and kind of the relationship was getting back on track. And then something else that happened exactly you know, within a few months of that was one of our friends was due to give birth. It's a second baby. Mm. Um, and at the time that that happened, um, it's a couple of weeks before and I'd spoken to her on the Friday, you know, let's go for a curry and I was away for the weekend and I got a call on the Sunday going, she's dead. You know, our friend's oh dead. Oh my God. Like, shit, what's happened? You know, how's the baby? And the baby's dead as well. She de did she die in childbirth? Or? So what happened was she got streptococcal in her throat and then that killed the baby and then the baby gave her septicemia. Oh. So we went from a, the sort of Thursday of that weekend before expecting to go out for a curry with her to that yeah. pre-birth curry yeah, celebrate the baby arriving and it's her second baby as well to on the Sunday she was gone and because of all the stuff that happened with the relationship and the finance and the trust element because the trust had broken down um, we just couldn't be there for each other and again when we needed to be there just that again just blew us apart and you know, we had to go through lots of things about supporting our friend Paul and, you know, he had a three-year-old to deal with on his own. At the same time, he just lost another baby and his wife and all sorts of stuff like that happened. And it was just a horrible, terrible time. Mm. Um, she was only in her sort of mid-30s at the time yeah, herself. Terrible. It's terrible. Yeah. yeah, something that you wouldn't and that, expect. And that really created the sort of a real blow in the relationship. And we tried to, we moved house and we, you know, tried a couple of other things. Um, and then with this other business that, where I was just working 80, 100 hour a week, you know, in that job to try and fix it and do things, get money in. You, you know, enjoying that do. job? Was it a job that you enjoyed? Or? Well, it was a startup that myself and a friend had done. You know, um, we, I had a web development background. Mm. So we thought we'd put together this social network, this social media um, place to be for people, but who geeks? Because I'm a bit of a geek. Mm. I'm a nerdy geek. You geek at heart. I, know, I didn't know that about heart. you, yeah. Auntie. Um, so I, I've had this hobby for years and years called live role play, which is a kind of mixture of like Lord of the Rings crossed with Amdram. And so you dress up in costume and you run around the woods and hit each other with swords. Um, and it's wow. something I've done since I've I was in my teenage years. I've heard about people that do that, yeah. actually. Yeah. Have you ever seen the, uh, the film Role Models or any of those kind of things? It's not a very good portrayal. But yeah. it, for me, it's very social. It was, it was an outlet. It was a way of not being myself, which is, you know, not recognising that's what I needed at the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I set up the social network. Cause Facebook was relatively new. It had only been around a couple of years mm. for geeks. Yeah. Yeah, anybody into video games and that kind of stuff. And, we got a couple of hundred thousand pounds of investment from um, people and friends and family and just didn't know how to manage the business properly and had to make 10 people redundant and get rid of everybody and lose like all that money. And times, yeah. So that was, again, mm. that was all happening at that moment in time. And, and ultimately it came to that point where we just decided to just stop. Whilst we're still talking to each other, mm. whilst we're still in a space where we can converse at least, let's just decide that we probably need to walk away from this relationship because yeah. it just isn't working. Yeah. Um, so that's what happened. Yeah. And you, so you moved back to your mum and dad. Yeah. And then what, we, what, we, what did you go through at that point? Well, um, um, that was a really difficult time, yeah, you know, I because I was really carrying this identity of I'm a failure, you're crap, you know, nobody in your family's ever gotten divorced. You know, I had lots of guilt, you know, people's money I'd lost, you know, other stuff that was going on. It's like repeating the same pattern and all of those things were playing in my head. And I kind of very much had that I'm a failure, you're useless type thing. And also very much contemplating that, like, what have, I, what have I got to look forward to now? My whole life purpose, legacy, all of those things. We were fortunate my ex and I wouldn't have kids or anything, mm. just the two of us. Um, and it was very much like, where do you go from here? You know, what's, what's next? Um, and I do remember one time sort of driving back home to the 
the house that we lived in, because it wasn't really a home by that point, you know, really contemplating driving along that road really fast and just flicking off and ramming myself into a tree. So ending it all. Yeah, because I just couldn't see, you know, what to do next. And is know. this when you started piling on the weight? Is that when you started? No, it was already very, um, sort of very heavy from that point of view as well. You know, the fact, the thing that stopped me piling myself into the tree was knowing how much I'd let my parents down. If that's what happened, that's the thing that stops me. You know, that was enough to stop me from doing that. Because I, I kind of, you know, when you, <laughs> I don't know if you do, but sometimes if you pl play your own funeral through in your head, and just look, imagine the look of disappointment. I couldn't cope mm. with how disappointed everybody well, would no, be. Well, no, and that's what, it's yeah. good that you, you and thought about that. Like that. you say, I was, you know, I was heavy at the time. I was 23 stone. And I'd always sort of carried a lot of weight um, as a kid. And I think I was, I was quite often stress eating, you know, eating lots of chocolate. I was going to say, was it a coping you know? mechanism for some of the things? I think, yeah, knowing what I know now, um, chocolate was happiness, chocolate was an emotion, chocolate mm. was a thing, eating yeah, was, you know, as, as a lot of people get themselves into the pattern. Um, and also working crappy hours, 100 hour weeks, bad diet, no exercise, all those kind of things really common. You know, it's really easy to put weight on. It's very tough to lose it. Um, and, and I guess, yeah. I mean, did you have any self-esteem, because, you know, in terms of weight gain and just carry on? Because you were, you were 23 stone? Yeah, 23 stone. 142 kilos, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, like, to look at you now, I wouldn't even imagine. And I've seen pictures of you, and, and I, I can't even believe it's the same person. Sort of sitting. Yeah, and I struggled to see the same person now to how I saw them. It's really interesting if you lose quite a dramatic amount of weight, mm -hmm. it does take quite a while for you to see the new you in the mirror. You kind of, you're expecting the old you. Um, and I, at the time when I moved back home with my mum and dad, I was 23 stone um, and completely just like need to do a life reset. You know, I still had my skills of web development. I still had that. Um, but the one thing that I also started to get into was personal development. So a friend of mine had lent me some Tony Robbins CDs, Unleash the Power mm. Within. And I just play that relentlessly. Just, it was just on a loop. It was in the car. It was in my headphones. It, you know, I was playing it to go to sleep too to shut these stupid bloody voices up. Um, what were the voices saying? Oh, we, we were just hateful, horrible. You know, the uselessness of it and the, all the things you've got to do and all the money that you owe people and all of these things. You know, it was just constantly playing over that loop of it's kind of like bile and hatred. You know, and it's it's, it's really. Fucked up, really. Our own voice. Was, if we our, actually our inner voice is our pretty, voice, pretty crap, really, isn't you know, it? That's when, it, when, it. In, when it's really in inner critic mode. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It can, your, our inner voice can be amazing as well. Yeah. But when it's in that inner critic mode and really playing across that, all that stuff that we, if we externalised and said it to a kid, we'd get arrested. You know. Do you think some people have got more of that inner critic? I mean, let, let's, we've, we've mm. all heard the inner critic, yeah. but I think there are those those people that maybe have heard it more or or focus on it more. Um, I think have you, have you seen that? I don't know whether or not we've got it more or less. I think one of the things I've learned now is quite often what we do is we take on beliefs from other people and we take on things that we've been called and things that we've been told and all of those things become our voice because we say them in our head. And it might be a society thing like, you know, kids should be seen and not heard or, you know, that's not what a woman should do, you know. And all this stuff gets absorbed and I think it then becomes our own mantras. You know, especially at an early age, right? Especially at an early age, yeah. Formed, yeah, in the first few years. Um, and so I had to start to sh shut those voices off and listening to things like Tony Robbins stuff. And um, there's a really good post poster, that, poster the um, Holstein Manifesto. I don't know if you've seen it, which is just a, a series of words that really resonated with me where I was. And I put that poster up on a wall. What's so it's it the first called? Thing. The Holstein? Hol Holstein, H-O-L-S-T-E-E, Manifesto. Holstein Manifesto, um, okay. And, and it's just all about the fact that, you know, travel and live and laugh and, you know, grow and, you know, it's all the, it's kind of positive affirmations. Mm. And, it, and I put it exactly where I would wake up and see it. Um, and so, yeah, being back at my mum and dad's kind of gave me a, the chance to have a bit of a reset. Um, and a few months after moving back in with them, I then went along to a, an intro day about NLP in London. Um, because the same guy that lent me the CDs had done some NLP training. In fact, he was a he was a master practitioner of NLP, and he had been doing coaching with me, and just kind of helping out as a, as a mate, yeah. um, and really started to allow me to kind of get my head into right. What can you control? What can you do? So I started to focus on my health first. And how did how did NLP help with that? Um, so it was all about recognizing 
what strategies do I need to do? Like I'm using NLP to quite externally reference. So what other people say to me makes a difference. Yes, yes. So being in a group environment makes a difference. Having feedback makes a difference. So I went along to a group boot camp because when I'm on the, my own in the gym, I let myself off the hook. I don't work so hard. Yes. I recognise that when I, like, I used to play squash, for instance, I used to play mm. squash with my dad. I loved playing squash with my dad because he was better than me. And doing stuff with people who are better than me drives me on. Okay. So because I recognise that, I found, um, I went along to a, a networking event that I used to belong to and I met this guy called Topsy. He was a royal, ex-Royal Navy PT. Um, and he ran these boot camps. He'd only been running them a year or two when I met him. And it was a group environment. Um, and I was newly single and there was lots of women there and I thought it'd be a good, <laughs> good, good place opportunity. to meet people. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, I'd never... You know, being 23, so never knocked my body confidence from that point of view. Um, I was just me. I was just wearing a lot of stuff on the outside. But actually, because I got into the exercise and I, I was being pushed, and I, I also paid him like 50 quid for the first yeah. thing. By paying 50 quid, I also got weighed. And I booked myself in then for 10 sessions. And because and I committed energetically to this yes, thing, yes. And I got into a habit. Well, by putting the money down as well, you're committing energetically. Exactly. And committing, yeah. yeah. That, and I had time yeah. because... So nobody asked to tell me what to do with my time or I had to ask for permission to go anywhere. Um, and so I, I, by doing and going to those boot camps, it really helped. And I, the first boot camp I ever went to, um, just before going to it, Sounds I had a tin of pineapple. Shivers up my spine, boot camp. <laughs> I, had, I had a tin of pineapple and a, and a cheese sandwich from the garage because I thought that'd give me energy for the boot camp. And I, and I almost blanked out after the warm out. I remember holding onto the bars and this sort of church hall thing, oh, the God. school hall that we were using. And almost being blanked out, and the guy came up to me going, oh, I don't know what you've done there, but you need some work to sort you out. Um, and we've been mates ever since, because that was just the camaraderie of that was so amazing. And so I got into the kind of the, the boot camp family, and I lost um, 32 kilos in nine months, wow. six and a half stone. Wow, that's yeah. fantastic. Because I was going and I was exercising, and I was also setting goals and being driven, and rather than trying to lose weight, I was looking to gain health. And once that's, that's a very interesting fact, actually, yeah. and it's, I guess it's, that's the changing language, isn't it? So yeah. It's not about losing weight, it's gaining health. Exactly. That's yeah. The, yeah. When I'm good. coaching clients now in their health, mm. it's which one motivates them more. Because some people are motivated by pain. Yeah. You know, sometimes something has to get bad enough that you have your had enough moment and you have to walk away. So the health as aspect and the NLP really helped you with losing the weight. Mm. Is that what drove you forward to, to go on and, and become a trainer? Yeah, definitely, because, uh, you, know, you know, you see those kind of before and after shots, you know, and you think, oh, that's just, uh, that's not the same person. Never, yeah. you know, and um, I became that person, you know, by setting goals and, you know, having things to aim for and go for, um, then suddenly, you know, I started to recognise that I could change and that it was all in my mind that yeah. needed to change first. Yeah. You know, NLP is not a magic weight loss formula for anybody mm. who's going mm. <laughs> to... I'm going to sign up for this. You have to put the work in. But but when you're motivated, mindset, you put the work in. Right? Exactly. It's yeah, the yeah, mindset. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you, know, you know, when you make your mind up, you know, when you change your mind, all those expressions are very true. You know, when you suddenly shift something that's going on up here, then all your behaviours can change. And um, I started to want more because I've been web developing for like 15, 20 years or so at that point. And I was just bored with it. I was just knocking websites out and doing it. And I kind of wanted my rest of my life job. And so I went along to like an NLP intro day and found out about, first of all, kind of, but day one, it was, cause it was a two day event, but day one, I want to be a coach. I thought, yeah, definitely. You can see myself doing that. And by day two, I thought, you look like you're having a lot of fun up there. And fun is a high value. Yes. Me. Yes. Yeah. So I, and, I can relate to that one. Yeah. And, and you, you look like you're having a lot of fun up there. And I also recognize that I can do so much more to light up other people by being the person on the yeah. stage yeah. than just coaching people. Yeah. Cause I can see let's say, five or six people effectively in one day as a coach. Mm. And I can train a room with 100, 200 yeah, people in it. And, and that makes a big difference. So that drove me to um, doing NLP. I remember ringing you up home going, um, Mum, does it right if I don't pay you rent? Because I want to spend this you know, £800 a month on NLP training for a year. I know I still owe you money. <laughs> and aside from all the other stuff, you know, and I really know that I can get something, you know, that I'd be good at doing this. Because I was recognize I was already coaching people in their businesses anyway. I was working with a lot of small businesses. And of course, you, if you're coaching a business, you're coaching an owner. 
And so I, I was coaching without giving a label, without knowing what I was doing at that moment in time. And what made you really think that NLP, I mean, was, it, was that a feeling you had? Was it something that your head said, yes, this is, this is the, the path that you're meant to go on? Because like you say, it's yeah. very different to the web developing. I, th I think it's because I recognised from learning more about NLP that it treats everybody as an individual. It's not a follow this set plan or do these seven things and it magically changes your life. Mm -hmm. NLP is all about how do you individually see the world and how is that created through your past and your memories and your decisions you made and then what can you do to shape what comes next. You can learn from the past and you can let it go. It isn't like counselling. You know, I've tried counselling, I've done that, yes, I didn't like yeah. it. It was unwrapping stuff that was I making it up or wasn't I? Did it matter? It's Not very really. very past focus. I've yeah. had, had done counselling as well and exactly. it's um, yeah. and, and the past. So for me it was... It was, it was too, everything else was too past focused and NLP was very much about what comes next. Mm. Um, and I teach NLP from a coaching perspective, not a therapy, I'm not a therapist. But it's really about learning from the past and not taking all that stuff forward into the future. Um, and so that's why for me, I really got drawn to NLP. I've not learnt at that moment in time any other coaching methods, I've not you know, done the coaching schools or any of those things. For me, NLP was the thing that I wanted to start coaching with. And straight away from doing the practitioner course and uh, and a sort of small hypnosis course. I started working with clients and, you know, started to make shifts and helping people stop smoking and all that kind of stuff. And I was just wow. loving doing that. Yeah. And, and that, at that point when I did my practitioner and then my master's and then my trainer's training all in one year, because I'm, I'm an all or nothing. I spent at least 100 days of that year learning NLP. I met Joe, my business partner, because we were doing the same courses mm -hmm. together. Um, we recognised that um, we're very much bounce off each other, you know, in terms of our approaches, they're different and yet we share similar values yeah. about helping people and working with people. Um, and so we set up um, a training organisation within a year or so. And it's now award winning, you're an award yeah, winning award -win. NLP training yeah. business, which yeah. is fantastic. And we'll put the name yeah. of that in the notes if anyone wants to get in touch with you and wants to know exactly, more yeah. about the NLP. How else did it change your life? Because I've heard there's other happy stories that have come yeah. from it. So once I um, uh, had looked at health, I sort of shifted in some of the other areas. Business was obviously changing because of the NLP stuff that I was doing. Um, and relationships was another area. But the problem with doing <laughs> these practitioner courses and running them, one, it's great because I'm on them, but two, you have to share and do things yes. and commit to goals. Yeah. You know, and, and I committed to all sorts of things like doing a triathlon, which I did three or four years ago. And, Congratulations. Yeah, and I also focused on my relationship values, what was important to me about a relationship. And what was what was important to you? Because you'd been through this yeah. painful divorce it was and sort of, marriage. Yeah, and that was a few years before, mm. and, and, and I've been in some other relationships, some shorter term and others longer. Um, and I kind of was getting to know what was and wasn't working for me in that. Um, first of all, it had to really get NLP, because some people saw NLP as a threat, like me evolving and changing my mindset and, and becoming more conscious of my unconscious. Mm -hmm. People kind of found threatening. Yeah. Um, so yes. they needed to get NLP, personal development. Um, also recognised that family was important to me. Mm -hmm. I hadn't wanted a family, but I suddenly recognised that I did if I had the chance. Yeah, no, and that's I'm interesting. Getting into my late 30s by this point. Okay, so it's no, not like you're a exactly. you are spring chicken, but you know, it's, it's, <laughs> yes, yeah. time to do something about it. Exactly, it? Yeah. yeah. And um, fun, and it had to be like a spark and a, and a connection, mm. something that really had to kind of get me and, and um, me them. And I was very lucky to get introduced to somebody. I'd been on a, a training course, been doing some training, and the trainer, the sort of day after the course, we were having a chat in a cafe um, about doing some work together, and she was going, "You need to ring my, you need to contact my friend Sophie. Yeah, I think you two need a coffee." Um, and she basically, Love it. Blind she basically date. made us. Um, and Sophie lived up in London, um, and I sent her a message within a sort of week of of being, you know, mentioned it, and so so well, your friend Caitlin says I should get. Uh, <laughs> <she's>, uh, <she'll laughs> to know who you are, but she's Facebook it. messaging, and went, "Oh, if, well, if my mate Caitlin says, then we should." Um, and actually, we got chatting on. Um, Facebook and phone and all that kind of stuff. And a couple of weeks later, we then met in person. Then I stayed the weekend and I got to meet her son <laughs> at that moment in time. Yeah. He was five and a mum. <laughs> wow, you went right, right know, in there straight in, in the deep end. Straight in there. Um, we had already clicked by this point. We already actually knew there was a, that spark bit was there. Um, and um, she's in this kind of world. She's actually a hypnobirthing teacher and a doula. Wow. So she empowers women to have confident you know, births, no matter what their circumstances. Um, 
And so she's also in this kind of sphere of personally developing herself yeah. and, and evolving through her story and her life. Um, and so, yeah, I became a stepdad, you know, not that long ago. We got married three years ago. Um, and having our own family was something that we really wanted. In fact, um, Sophie was actually pregnant during our marriage, during the wedding. Um, but we found out a few weeks after the wedding, having had an early scan, that it wasn't, there was a, you know, there's a, something called a blighted ovum where you get the egg sac, but no baby in there. So she was, all the signs of pregnant, oh, gosh. thought she was pregnant, but then she wasn't. So I had to have a, a, a sort of chemical miscarriage, if you like, take the tablets. And that was yeah. crappy. Yeah, kind of, it doesn't sound you know, like you tell, your, yeah. you tell your friends, but you shouldn't tell your friends. Mm. And they always say, wait for the 12 weeks. But there was no actual baby there. There was no actual was... baby there. And something else that kind of happened around that time is my dad was really poorly. So he'd had um, Parkinson's. We got that diagnosis sort of several years ago. Um, and he wasn't able to make the wedding. And um, he was also getting to the point where he'd had a fall and he was being looked after at home, almost at that point, palliative care. And I remember telling him about the pregnancy and that we were having the baby. And I just, I remember seeing that kind of light in his eyes, it just sort of, the happiness. Um, but he never got to meet any of his grandkids. So, which really guts me, as you can tell. Um, because he would have made a great granddad. <laughs> but he's here, right? Yeah. He's there. I don't he know is. what your beliefs are. But, um... Yeah. And you always, you know, people don't have to be in your life to, to know what they would mm. have said. And him towards the end wasn't him. I remember when we're playing squash or when he, he was in the Navy and, you know, when he in his uniform and getting his MBE from the Queen and all these amazing things, wow, this role model amazing. that was my dad. Um, yeah, that wasn't him at the end, but that was certainly him in that process. And, and so, yeah, we lost that baby that wasn't really a baby, but kind of still, yeah. she was still pregnant. Um, but thankfully, you know, a couple of years ago, we had um, another baby, um, Megan, who arrived um, at terminal velocity, <laughs> <laughs> almost, in our bathroom. Just me and Sophie, no midwives around, just wow. the two of us. Um, we, were, we had planned to have Megan at home. Um, but uh, the midwives had gone home because they thought everything had slowed down. And then mm. as soon as midwives had gone, then Fred had gone to school. Boom, half an hour later. It's amazing. She's here. Amazing. <laughs> Dropped in the most important Good catch I think I ever made. Yeah, yeah just uh, to go from those, those sort of eight years ago, or 10 years ago, with all that crap that's happening and life and family and all those kind of things, family is really important to me. Um, and to now have that family, I'm just so blessed because of it's that. It's a complete transformation, Andy. Yeah. It really yeah. is. So where do you see yourself going? You know, what, what, what is your legacy? What do you want to continue doing now? Well, for me, um, the key, key element to what I do is about enabling people to know that they can change their lives. Mm -hmm. they, they, oh, they really can, and you're, you're the living proof process. of it. Yeah, you've been but not just to be the living proof of it, because I still think people are sceptical when they see you talk about your, you know, what maybe has gone on in your life, and they go, oh, but I can't do that because of this. And it's getting past the what's the small steps What's the tiny incremental tweaks? Because you don't go from, you know, losing 32 kilos overnight. No, of you know, It is one grain, one gram, half a pound. This, it is one change of thought process. It's, is there anything, that if you were uh, talking to our audience now, is there one little thing that they could take that would be if they were in a bad place or going through some sort of adversity that you would say, this is maybe something you should think about doing or... I think the key thing is one, externalise it, get it outside of yourself, write mm. it down right? and talk about it you know, as, a, as a thing or a problem. Yeah? And then recognise what advice would you give yourself. If it's your friend coming to you yeah, and they'd written this stuff down, they've written you a letter with all these things in, what advice might you give them? Yeah. You know? Or who are the gurus that you might go to or even the you know, people that are here or not here? You know, I still can ask my dad for advice mm. even though he's not here. You know, and I know what he might say about this, that or the other. Um, that's really nice. What it's advice might they give people. about what you could do? Yeah. And also focus on what you want rather than what you don't want. So many people focus on their don'ts rather than their do's. Um, so a great question to ask yourself is what would I like to have happen? Yes. Because that, that enables you to start to set a goal and an outcome because um, things, you can picture how, things, how bad things might get, which is very different to having to be there. Mm. Um, and also getting put towards a goal, be on purpose, you know, have that purpose. You, know, you, you need to start to train your brain into noticing the things that it wants rather than what you don't want. You know, this area of your brain, the reticular activating system, 
it's the bit of the brain that you start to notice similarities and differences, and it's the bit the brain that's activated by things like the law of attraction. Yes, you know, yes. Putting your vision boards up, saying your affirmations. Like, tell yourself what you want. Because mm. yeah, if you keep telling yourself what you don't want, you notice all the it's don't's. Gonna, yeah, exactly. You know, and that's what's... Just simple things like that. Getting it outside of yourself and focusing on your to-dos. You know, and then go, right, what one thing can I do to start to get this towards a step? Tiny, 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 tiny changes make a big it. difference. So focus on the to-dos and yeah. the positives rather than the negatives. Yeah. Andy, we're running out of time. I, I feel like I could talk to you forever. <laughs> um, and we've probably reached, well, we've reached my last question, mm. which I ask all my guests, and that's, is if you were to write a message in a bottle to be found by future generations, what would that message be? Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I think the key thing is listen to your instincts, your intuition, learn to love it and trust it. I love it. Yeah. Andy, thank you so much for being a guest thank on my you show. So much. Thank Great you so much. Great to be here. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed the show. Remember, there's a new interview out every Monday. So hit subscribe and like and you'll get it straight into your inbox.